Well, Jan, uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. I also thank you for uh, the invitation to speak here. Uh, it is a pleasure, it is an honor for me to be here uh, uh, and speak to you uh, in the grand uh, lecture series. Uh, perhaps before I get started, uh, let me make one remark to this wonderful environment that you have here. And uh, yesterday when I uh, was talking to Professor McKinnon, he explained to me uh, what the meaning of the building is, the Institute of Future Environments. It's about uh, solid environments, built environments, it's about natural environments, uh, and also it's about uh, computational and uh, um, uh, mind environments. And this is what I would like to do today. I would like to take you to a journey uh, along thoughts. What can plastics do for the energy transition? and why are plastics uh, uh, are prone to take a key role in driving the energy transition. Now, before I get started, uh, let me also perhaps uh, dedicate this lecture to Professor Graeme George, who happened to be my host here, uh, but also uh, for his extraordinary work that he did over the past decades, I may say, in polymer science, uh, which all of us in that field uh, appreciate. Now, a grand challenge lecture series, here are three challenges right away on one picture. The left one refers to plastics. Uh, one of the huge challenges that we have right now, of course, is plastics waste. It's not so much the plastics waste here and there. Around campus, I hardly saw any anyway. Uh, but it's the waste that we find uh, in the oceans. If you look at the uh, area uh, that you find in the oceans, uh, uh, it's currently uh, 1.3 million uh, uh, square kilometers that accumulated over the time. Uh, I checked uh, this afternoon, uh, it's roughly the size uh, maybe of um, uh, this state. So uh, it's, I think as far as I know it's a little bit larger. But there's other problems that you see here compared to the uh, amount of uh, tons that plastics waste make up per year the CO2 uh, uh, emissions are a lot higher. And uh, if you compare then uh, the amount of uh, forest clearance each year, I mean, these are numbers that are even uh, far beyond what we have in terms of annual plastics waste. Now, this is not to say plastics is not a problem. It is a problem. But I selected this very picture here uh, for a very different reason. There's one thing all these three problem fields, and they are grand problem fields, uh, have together. And their interconnection is they are carbon-based. Plastics, as the essential element, use carbon. CO in a macromolecular form. CO2, use it in a small molecular form. And of course, wood, cellulose-based, is again carbon-based. And I hope by the end of the lecture, I will sort of uh, uh, resolve the puzzle why I think uh, they need to be uh, uh, working together and it has to do with energy transition. Now, plastics, how innovative they can be compared to like throwaway products. Uh, I selected this picture here because it highlights what performance improvements and what innovation means. And uh, if one were to translate the sustainability term to using uh, materials, it's more performance, less material, less energy. Uh, this particular bag that you see here has a weight of 40, 50 grams. It can carry loads up to 100 kilograms. Uh, those who own bags like that don't really think about throwing them away, so they are reusable. Uh, and of course, this is the kind of performance uh, uh, improvement that we need. More performance, more function, less material, less energy, and whatever we use in the remaining materials and energy, hopefully by regenerative resources. Now, even more high-tech, a little story from my past. I used to be involved uh, uh, in the 80s uh, when uh, Airbus was competing against Boeing, and at that time, Boeing dominated the market. Uh, so Airbus needed to move ahead with new technologies, which they did, uh, which you see here, the Airbus uh, uh, improvement in advanced composites, high strength carbon fiber materials compared to Boeing. And the blue line down here, Boeing was just crossing again. So 
Uh, but this is a tremendous innovation potential that's behind it, and right now a lot of people are trying to capitalize on that, and that's probably the thought that many think is what the uh, future is for cars. Uh, materials uh, that outperform uh, metals and all kinds of metals in terms of strengths, in terms of stiffness, and uh, in many cases, many times also uh, in terms of damage tolerance and other properties. Now, the ultimate goal in efficiency is, of course, to get below one liter per 100 uh, kilometer driving. Uh, and this one remaining liter essentially should be uh, coming from renewable resources. Now, the largest market, uh, and that is important for these type of materials. Meanwhile, it used to be aerospace, it used to be uh, 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 the sporting goods industry, which was quite large, but the largest market right now is wind power. And here you see an example of how plastics are used, advanced composites are used uh, in these uh, wind plates. Sorry, I guess I have to move back. Um, in these wind plates with diameters now of 160 meters, there's no other kind of material that could sustain such lengths that could be transported over uh, 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 the distances and it could be built up and generate uh, a 7 uh, to 8 gigawatt uh, with one power plant. So these are some of the examples what can be done with plastics. Uh, let's now uh, sort of look at some of the issues that I'd like to address. Before I get to plastics, let me spend a couple of minutes and slides. Uh, why uh, and, uh, should we uh, go for a transformation of the energy system and is it feasible before we move then on with what plastics should do and can do? Now, at the time when I was working in advanced composites, the slide that I had shown you earlier, uh, working for uh, Airbus uh, structures and suppliers, um, I ran across a picture uh, from uh, the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, uh, uh, which is sponsored uh, worldwide by governments and companies. Uh, and uh, it is one, from one person who is very well known about these technology transitions and of course it shows uh, in the early slide of 1987 uh, transitions have been occurring all the time from wood to coal, oil, uh, gas and here what you see in the 70s of course nuclear uh, and here there's an indication sulfus which is sort of a combination of solar and fusion. Uh, now, if we take a look at uh, what uh, happened later, uh, let's look at the options uh, uh, and evaluate these. Actually, I started out right after reading um, uh, the book, Our Common Future, uh, which redefined the term uh, sustainable development at that time. Uh, I started to get in interested into what is the role of plastics in a sustainable development scenario. Uh, I'm not Actually, I postponed my inaugurational lecture. I became professor in 1991, so I went on a, uh, what I call a magic solar mystery tour first to figure out where can we do something with plastics in solar because I was at that time learning from reading these books. The transformation of the current uh, fossil fuel nuclear-based energy system to an energy system substantially to fully based on renewable resources is at the very core of sustainable development strategies. It's more important than many other issues. I'm not saying it's the most important. There may be a discussion, but it's certainly a key subject. Now, <clears throat> the second thing is uh, that such an energy system, by various uh, um, angles of, of um, uh, looking at it, uh, one finds out it's Possible, of course, theoretically in any case. Technology, uh, meanwhile, many people believe too. Uh, there's a couple of other reasons why we should do that. It's uh, in the realm of politics, uh, ecology, socioeconomy, uh, particularly from a macroeconomic point of view. Uh, and last but not least, and I think this is an aspect which is equally important to all others, it will serve to reduce the global disparity between developed and less developed countries, and I will get back to that. It will serve to uh, promote democracy compared to perhaps other uh, regimes. So at that time I draw up a, co a curve which I modified from the EASA, saying, okay, 
What would be nice would be if we can achieve at least 50% renewables, and let's see what we can do with plastics. Some people at that time were already shooting for 100% renewables. Uh, and uh, let's now look what happened in the years to come. Now, at that time, it was clear to me uh, uh, that we would need to be searching for ways uh, to use plastics for various reasons, which I will explain later. Uh, but it needs a key materials technology to support these energy technologies, uh, both in function and in speed of growth. The growth rates that you see here are sort of unprecedented before. The only time before where we saw similar growth rates was with nuclear in the 70s. And as you see indicated here, that stopped. And uh, at this stage, let's just look uh, at some of the data, uh, uh, more recent data. Uh, where we are right now, but I uh, most recently had another uh, uh, inaugural lecture as I switched uh, the uh, university. I look a little bit older now, uh, but uh, the, my main conclusion was actually what we should be striving for by 2050, and this is in good agreement with like at least strategy European Union. Uh, to be 80% decarbonized, which means uh, an equivalent amount of uh, renewable uh, uh, resource energies. Uh, for the polymer industry and for the polymer community, it's of course the question, now is the time to really move into these technologies uh, and capitalize on it. Uh, I found this picture particularly interesting uh, from the uh, Renewables Energy uh, uh, Status Report which comes out every year and every other year sometimes. Uh, at the time when I had my first uh, inaugural lecture, I mean, we were far uh, below 1% of the new renewables. Uh, now, even if you subtract uh, traditional biomass from the 16.7% uh, and water, we are in digit numbers like 4 to 5% of actual new renewable technologies. Uh, to many, uh, this came as a large surprise. Many, even working in the field, overlooked what had happened over the last 10 to 15 years in the renew renewable energy technologies. And meanwhile, uh, uh, the big question is, if we can sustain the speed at which renewables grow for another couple of years, there is no return. The tipping point will be reached, and currently a couple of years in a row, the added capacity by renewable technologies outperforms all the added capacity by other forms, despite the fact there's a lot of coal being built in China, for example. Now, as far as nuclear is concerned, um, I don't think they will be ever again uh, above 3%. There's various reasons for that. Since we're in Australia and I've learned that nuclear is not really an issue here, I guess we might as well move on to the next slide. Now, these are the perspectives of the renewable uh, world. I mean, these are some of the uh, renewable scenarios for the, of the uh, European Photovoltaic Association. Uh, they uh, tend to have an approach which is probably pretty common. I, I call it lower bound, business as usual, upper bound, which is the most advanced scenario, and then one medium bound scenario. Um, and uh, currently, they are developing along the upper bound curve. What is particularly interesting, if you compare the predictions of the International Energy Agency 2008, 2030. I mean, they were thinking photovoltaic, it takes 20 years uh, before it starts to take off. So, two years later, 2010, they sort of shifted it forward. Uh, and the industry, the APIA, of course, uh, uh, thinks it can be even going faster. Now, uh, we sort of uh, worked out, even for this scenario, what can the polymer industry do and why should they do it? And my first impression was, here we are talking about thin films, encapsulation films. Uh, I will later on point out why these are so critical in further cost reduction, but even more so in speeding up the growth rates. Because we are, we, what we are entering right now, we are keeping up high growth rates and we are growing into larger and larger volumes. It's diff more difficult uh, to uh, uh, add every year that type of percentage. 
but this is the strength of plastics. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think the plastics industry will have a key role, which one I will tell you later on, but uh, a look at the sheer numbers. Right now, there's like 300 million tons of uh, plastics worldwide produced per annum. Uh, this is alone the number that you see here for photovoltaics, if that would come uh, uh, to come true. Now, basically what we can say is the uh, new scenario sort of look like, so uh, we may as well forget sulfurs, I think. Uh, they would be waiting for too long for so, uh, solar. Nuclear is out of the game. There's one important worldwide bridging technology, which is, of course, gas. Uh, and the rest is sort of the question, how fast can we ride up uh, uh, this growth curve uh, for renewables? Now, uh, why should we transform uh, the energy system? First, I showed you it happened all the time anyway, so it's not really a surprise. Second, why should we take extra efforts to speed these things up? Naturally, all things in development are speeding up, so that's the obvious reason. But there are a couple of more uh, concrete reasons which I tend to call, there's a group of reasons which uh, are problem-oriented uh, motivations, and there's a second group of uh, reasons which I call innovation and market-oriented considerations. So as far as the problem-oriented view and motivation, uh, I think they are well known. First of all, limitations in the availability of fossil fuel uh, carbons, not necessarily in physical terms, uh, more in geopolitical terms. Uh, that is uh, probably the higher constraint. And uh, second, climate change issue, which are uh, well known anyway. So this sort of sums up the problem-oriented view. Um, the source and where we dispose uh, are the products of the energy system. The innovation and market-oriented point of view uh, has a couple of um, uh, very different uh, uh, aspects to consider. There's a huge potential for efficiency technologies, which means for a lot of industries, there's lots of work, there's a high innovation potential. Second, there's sufficient solar energy available uh, for the rest in the remaining energy uh, uh, needs. And third, uh, for those uh, in the business world, of course, uh, incredible market uh, uh, growth rates. And uh, this is why many of these uh, technologies have gained in uh, the last years with some ups and downs, uh, uh, increasingly uh, investors' uh, attention. Uh, last but not least, why else? What is another reason? Well, the number of countries with policy targets which are increasingly becoming more ambitious is also rising. Uh, and let me add here, at this stage, I'm uh, very impressed in particular what's happening here at the university landscape in Australia uh, in their sustainability uh, scenarios and sustainability targets that they have. Uh, let's take a brief look at the first thing, the availability of uh, carbon, uh, uh, fossil fuel carbons. Uh, currently, there's this off and on, there's this peak oil discussion. And uh, uh, we have tried at one point, not for reasons because we believe there's a physical limitation, there may be an economical and a geopolitical uh, situation, what we, would happen if those guys who predict peak oil to happen somewhere between, some say it happened already a couple of years ago, uh, some say, oh, there will be another peak up, so maybe by 2030. Uh, so, uh, we have been trying to do how may that affect the polymer industry since plastics it, uh, uh, these days are still made out of fossil fuels, mainly out of uh, 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 crude oil, of course. Now, currently, plastics make up 5% of the crude oil uh, production. Uh, many in the oil industry say plastics are our waste product. Those who are in the plastics industry, of course, say uh, we are the value-added product. But the sheer difference between 95 and 5 percent, I mean, this is small business for the, uh, um, uh, the oil industry. Now, we then took next step. We said, okay, let's merge plastics growth rates. And we assumed simple numbers, let plastic grow by 2, 4, 6 percent. This 6% is the plastic growth of the last uh, uh, four to five uh, decades, uh, essentially affecting uh, welfare for one billion people. 
Now, plastics are, of course, a type of product that can easily be um, uh, distributed and will be used in this consumer-wise liked by a growing population. I think all these numbers that we put here sort of are not very aggressive. One can discuss uh, about the 6%. We cut this curve over there uh, with the uh, scenarios available in the literature for peak oil. Of course, they change. Apparently, they sort of moved out shorter times. Uh, but independent of all that, and there was a third approach that we took. We covered population growth, per capita use of plastics, sort of superimposed uh, a, a welfare model, and this is the orange bar that you find here. The major conclusion out of that is uh, beyond, uh, say, any, any um, accuracies uh, in the detail of 10 or 15 years, by 2050, plastics will make up anything from 20 to 50 percent of the crude oil, which of course will change the game altogether. Uh, and from that, uh, I came up with my fourth hypo hypothesis. I think it's time uh, that the uh, interests of the oil industry, uh, the polymer industry, um, and the solar industry should converge. Uh, in the interest of the polymer industry, it's a lot better to produce solar technologies out of plastics and save their raw materials for the future use. Is there enough available? Well, you all know the numbers, how many uh, times uh, uh, the solar influx uh, is above uh, the um, uh, current uh, uh, needs, the energy needs. Uh, I particularly like the, the, the uh, picture here from Professor Rubia, a Nobel Prize uh, uh, Award uh, person who uh, sort of drew up on the map for the Sahara, ex uh, uh, extrapolating to 2050 in a not very ambitious mode, how much area would we need for concentrated solar power in the Sahara? And it's the green little dot there in the middle. So a fraction of what we have for uh, agriculture, a fraction of what we are using for roads, a fraction of the surface that we are using for many other things with current technology at the right place uh, uh, would be sufficient to supply world needs with the solar influx. The way he uh, sort of boiled it down to was it's raining 20 centimeters of oil each year in Sahara, so one must be questioning why are they drilling deep into the ground in order to get the oil. Now, another picture of availability which is interesting um, uh, is this one here from uh, um, the uh, um, German Center of uh, Aerospace in Stuttgart. Uh, and uh, uh, Johann Nietzsche applauded the availability of various uh, um, uh, renewable energy technologies compared, this little uh, uh, cube here is what we currently need in terms of energy worldwide. Uh, the orange bar uh, is uh, the solar influx, uh, the red bar is wind, biomass, and so on and so forth. So the most important uh, influx that we have is solar, the second is wind. Uh, if you look at the distribution where we are right now, it's just uh, the other way around. So there is a lot more hydro and water, and there's much less solar and wind. So those two have, in terms of total capacity, of course, um, uh, uh, much to catch up, but they are uh, those with the high growth rates, so we are moving into the right direction. So here's a, a picture again from the uh, Renewables Global Status Report indicating average growth rates uh, which are double digit for all uh, important solar technologies, solar thermal on the left side, photovoltaics in the center, and wind uh, over the past five uh, to eight years. Of course, uh, we will not be capable to uh, uh, retain the rates forever, but these are incredible high growth rates, and that brings me back. What must the role of plastics be in order to halfway sort of keep this uh, uh, growth uh, moving? Now, <clears throat> uh, coming back to the thesis, uh, um, pl plastics will be the prime material. Uh, one thing is for sure, before we talk about energy generation, all measures should be taken uh, to become efficient. Uh, so houses should become efficient first before we supply uh, solar. So these are simple rules that one yeah, uh, usually finds. 
And if we apply this type of rule uh, to the uh, global picture uh, of energy supply, where we have a picture here right now uh, uh, for the fossil energy cycle, uh, which supposedly is fossilized uh, biomass, uh, taking, of course, millions of years. Then we drill uh, somewhere for fossil fuels, uh, transport it via the half of the globe, uh, and uh, burn it at temperatures above 1,000 degrees C, uh, where I live, to generate 20 degrees C room temperature. And that makes up 30% of our end energy needs. Uh, I could of course, doing uh, this entire uh, analysis provide you uh, with a couple of other uh, examples. Uh, I guess we all know that our current technologies are in most cases very, very far away from uh, by a total view being considered as um, uh, efficient. Uh, if we were to take the solar case, currently we have uh, uh, photovoltaics who has the least efficiency from those that we have measured per uh, uh, area uh, density, uh, but we still get an efficiency um, uh, of, uh, say, 40 to 16 to 18 percent currently commercially available. Um, if you were to do the other cycle, the photosynthesis by itself already is below 1 percent. Uh, it doesn't compare. There's orders of magnitude difference. So if you go from the primary source sun, the fastest way is to use it directly. And uh, that is, of course, the issue of technology. And uh, we need uh, to look for these energy services, like I said, more efficiency, more systems intelligence first. Then we need less energy, less material. And then we can do it with regenerative resources. Now, I'd like to give you now a couple of examples uh, what plastic can do there. Now, <clears throat> again, the most important feature that plastic can, plastics can bring in uh, in helping resolve some of these issues is their excellent performance profile, their property profile. Uh, there is no other class that offers as wide a range that can be tailored and adapted uh, compared to plastics in terms of their properties. There is no other material class that has the design flexibility that we have with plastics and has the capability of multifunctional integration. Of course, these are the very reasons why in many other fields plastics have developed so successfully and had high growth rates. And, uh, of course, this extraordinary growth capacity uh, still remains for the foreseeable future. I'd like to show you uh, a number of um, uh, examples for that. Coming back to growth rates, here is a development of steel and plastics worldwide. Uh, plastics is the newest uh, uh, of the large uh, material classes, sort of were invented as synthetic polymers roughly 100 years ago, as industrially uh, um, uh, used polymers to a significant extent. Actually, it started after World War II. Uh, and uh, look at the growth rates that we had. In 1980, uh, plastics outperformed metals and continuous growth rates uh, uh, of in the order global uh, in the last decades uh, of 6%. Uh, in terms of properties, well, let's look at mechanical properties. There's a uh, range of properties that you can get metals uh, uh, to be tailored to. You can do that uh, to a certain degree with ceramics, woods. If you look what plastics can do, elastomers, polymer foams, conventional plastics, advanced composites as the ones that we have seen them. There's no other material class where you can vary the property range by orders of magnitude as you can do it with plastics. And uh, like I indicated before, of course, that is the very reason why they are used in high strength, high stiffness applications, high flexibility applications that we have in many technical components why they are used as foams, and why they are used in many other structural applications. There is no other material class that can do uh, mass transfer and energy transfer, by, by which I mean either transport or transformation. 
changing one energy form into another energy form, or doing mass reactions in the polymer, or doing just selectively uh, energy passing or uh, uh, emitting uh, what we can do with plastics. Again, the thermal properties are needed for efficiency. A beautiful uh, example, of course, that everybody knows is Gore-Tex uh, of selective mass transfer. Droplets, rain, doesn't move in. Of course, uh, in, in the wet form, it cannot enter from the outside to the inside. Uh, in the uh, damp forms, a sweat, of course, it moves from the inside out. Even packaging materials, in many cases, are extremely sophisticated materials in terms of their barrier properties that they need, uh, in terms of the information that they need, and in terms of the mechanics that they have. So uh, the key issue here is all these success factors that have led to the economic development, of course, and the wide range of applications, that's what we need to uh, uh, use in the development of solar uh, and renewable technologies. One last aspect about efficiency. There's one uh, interesting study that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, it was actually contracted by the European plastics uh, supplier industry, uh, and they uh, uh, gave a contract to um, um, a research institution in Vienna. Uh, the objective was they should work out a scheme if all applications where currently plastics are used, if we were to use the next best material class. So uh, plastics were replaced either in the models by wood, by paper, by uh, metals, by aluminum, by glass. Uh, and in 80%, uh, they concluded with reference samples, they concluded in 80% you could still replace plastics by other materials. To me, that number a little bit high, but this is what they did. And then they made total life cycle analysis. Uh, if one were to do that, uh, uh, they figured out, of course, we would need 32% uh, uh, more energy uh, if we were to do that, and the CO2 emissions uh, in the European energy mix would increase by 70%. So, so much uh, to efficiency. Uh, this uh, let me make uh, my fifth hypothesis here, which reads, any oil and energy price will be good for the plastics industry. However, the higher the oil price, the better for the plastics industry. There's a little uh, sentence down there which uh, accounts for the fact, well, if the whole economic system goes sort of disruptive, uh, it will affect the plastics industry as well. But uh, this hypothesis is firmly based on the fact if plastics are not more energy efficient uh, and raw material efficient in their applications, then they should indeed be replaced, and I, I think the study so showed uh, that in most cases uh, this is in fact the case. Now if we look now at buildings, what energy efficiency and solar can do together, uh, here is again a house, 30% in uh, Central Europe is low energy heating. Um, that is uh, the blue line up there in the winter time, the irradiation in terms of energy uh, per day that's uh, coming onto the house surface. And the green bar here is various building standards in terms of heating energy. The red bar down here is what is referred to in Europe. I'm not sure whether this is down here. Probably you don't need such houses. They call it passive houses. They don't need any extra heating system anymore. They combine heat and fresh air in a manner uh, since they are extremely high, uh, highly insulated. Now, if you compare a passive house standard with that energy influx, you should be able to gain from the surface all the energy uh, uh, that is needed. And indeed, a couple of houses have been built uh, trying to use that in a passive, in an active way. Uh, uh, one of the first houses that used a combination of various technologies uh, was the Energy Autonomous Solar Building in uh, Freiburg uh, at the Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, uh, it was built early uh, 90s. It contains uh, photovoltaics on the top. What one doesn't see here is uh, solar thermal. Uh, what, one, what is seen here, uh, uh, these glassy windows here, is uh, an element uh, that is referred to uh, as transparent insulation. I will explain in a moment what that is. 
Um, uh, it also used uh, um, hydrogen uh, production uh, uh, by electrolysis from water with the uh, electricity generated by PV. And of course, it had a fuel cell there in order to use the hydrogen. Now, if one were to analyze this house, in fact, this was the house that we visited on our solar mystery tour. Lots of plastics, lots of plastics. So a couple of years later, um, uh, we decided to build a house uh, uh, in a very, very different style. Uh, my wife uh, wanted to have a country house, which is this part of the house, and my idea was to get the country house totally solar. Uh, so I was responsible for the uh, upper picture there, which is like the south side. Um, so I was playing with the architect, the angles and the uh, square meters that we need here and there. And we had a research project running, uh, which we brought back from our solar mystery tour, which was this transparent insulation. Uh, was not quite uh, as good as we uh, thought that uh, plastics can manage to be. Uh, so uh, we had our own uh, transparent insulation uh, developed uh, in a research project, and I uh, built it here on the house. So this is the glassy surface here uh, on the front. Now, uh, this transparent insulation works in a way. It's a transparent plastic element that needs to ensure that a high proportion of the sunlight passes through, uh, gets to the wall, and transforms uh, the short-range irradiation into heat. So the wall uh, acts as an absorber. Uh, and from that point on, of course, the um, um, transparent insulation has to assure that there are no heat losses again uh, to the outward surface, but the heat should be transported inside the house. Uh, that means you need to produce a small uh, cell structure in order to have no uh, convection. Uh, you need to reduce uh, heat conduction, and you need to uh, look at uh, radiation losses. Uh, and uh, uh, Gernot Weiner, who is now my colleague, he actually did his dissertation on, on that work. This is, was our learning uh, how plastics interact with solar. So you take plastics that are highly transparent for incoming light, that don't, uh, for infrared radiation, they work as barrier. The rest is more or less a design and optimization problem uh, and a problem of the proper material selection. Uh, well, the result was, uh, after applying science to designing this type of thing, uh, we had the world best efficiency. It was also measured by the Fraunhofer Institute uh, uh, in Germany. Uh, and the most important thing I would like to point out, again, it turned out the principle, thin polymer films, cell structures, 98% air, 2% plastic. So this is little amount of material and high performance. Now, we looked at, I think, in total 70 commercial polymer films. And the most interesting thing was, uh, what we learned is, uh, the material that worked best because it absorbs infrared uh, uh, the best and transports it back to the house is cellulose triacetate, which is like this material down here uh, in terms of its molecular structure. It's based on a renewable raw material, cellulose. Uh, it contains uh, uh, a number of CO, uh, C groups. Uh, those are the ones that absorb, so essentially it works like the greenhouse effect directly in front of the wall, and the CO2 essentially is sort of hooked up into the molecule where we would like to have it, uh, and this is how you can use the effect for uh, local heating uh, uh, rather than global uh, uh, heating as we have it in our uh, climate problem. Uh, the next thing you can do, of course, with plastics, uh, many people said, okay, what are you doing in summer? You know, it might, you, the house gets to be a sauna. Uh, well, you can set up plastics such as multi-phase systems that you simply tell them, or you, you train them, basically, uh, at a certain temperature to move from transparent to opaque. Uh, uh, then they don't let the uh, radiation pass through to the wall, and then you don't have any overheating effect. Uh, there are a lot easier uh, ways also to do that, but uh, that would uh, probably be beyond today's time. Now, 
what I think what is really coming now is uh, one of uh, the worldwide um, uh, large uh, inverter suppliers, Fronius, is now moving into hydrogen technology. So whatever I have shown you so far is one family house, 60 square meter P PV, fuel cell concept, the only storage tank that they need, six meters long somewhere in the garden, 30 centimeters in diameter, currently still a little bit expensive. Um, uh, they produce their own hydrogen uh, uh, by electrolysis and they uh, meanwhile have a uh, fuel cell system uh, and then use hydrogen again for uh, electricity and for heat. This is what it looks like. I mean, in the various uh, uh, ways, too, uh, this is the technical room, so to speak. So uh, it takes up less space than people used to have when they had oil heating or uh, other type of heating forms in their houses. Uh, the interesting thing is, meanwhile, they are moving this type of system to refurbishing uh, because we will not change the energy system just by building new houses, so we need technologies, of course, for refurbishing. Uh, and this, to, in my view, turns out to be a, a extremely and extraordinary flexible uh, and adaptable technology and easy to handle. Uh, so this is why I think uh, uh, maybe things will be moving now strongly into this direction. Now, how do we move up with plastics now, this learning curve? Well, as we did in other areas, we need to fulfill the requirements that plastics had in all their success fields over there. May they be packaging, building, automotive. Improved performance, enhanced cost effectiveness, guaranteed quality uh, and uh, attractive design, which essentially says innovation, innovation, innovation. Uh, this is why we started a number of larger scale uh, uh, research projects uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, they are sort of shown up here. They deal with uh, solar thermal collectors, solar thermal systems, photovoltaics, some are national programs. Uh, we are also uh, working together with international groups, uh, the International Energy Agency and the European project. The current budget uh, that runs into that is uh, 50 million uh, euros. Uh, and let me just uh, highlight a couple of uh, uh, issues of how these projects are set up. Essentially, with that type of money, we said we're going to involve all the scientific partners that we need across the innovation chain and all the company partners that have an interest in uh, moving ahead with such a technology in such a project. Uh, so basically, starting from raw material side, we are processing subcomponent production, uh, solar thermal system. Essentially, we merge the competencies of the industry and of the uh, scientific institutions in the solar field and in the plastics field. Um, and uh, we also included, there's one particular uh, little highlight that I'd like to point your attention to. Uh, engineers are obviously not the best designers, as I'm sure um, many people will agree. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we invited uh, uh, a group uh, from the Arts University, a, an industrial design group. Of course, they had no idea what the thermal collector is. Um, they always said and were correct, we had no idea what design is. Uh, and we also had an economic group doing the economic assessment. The basic idea was whatever we need in a collector, may they be glazings, may they be foams, may they be components that are exposed to extremely high temperatures and pressures. We find them anywhere in our uh, uh, appliances, in, the, in cars, in, in home appliances, or may they be building surfaces uh, where the architects have used a lot of membrane surfaces and all kinds of functions that they implement with plastics into the surface. Uh, a particular interesting one is the one, uh, the membrane surface at the uh, Bayern Munich uh, Stadium uh, in passing by. Those people who know at least the, read, know to read the colors can tell by the colors what kind of teams uh, are competing inside. Now, the second thing, taking this knowledge uh, was to work out what must a uh, polymer collector, um, uh, 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 what, what kind of loads is a polymer collector exposed to. So we divided the world into uh, five regions. 
Um, probably, uh, it looks to me now accounting that maybe Australia is not really a country for solar thermal, uh, but it was Essence, Fortaleza, Graz, it, Graz for Austria, Pretoria, and Peking. So covering uh, uh, the main climate conditions that are of importance to plastics, indicating what temperatures we have there, whether they are freezing, uh, how high the temperatures can get, uh, we looked at the irradiation, the cumulative irradiations, because plastics age if they are on outside surfaces. Uh, and a uh, third important aspect to many plastics is, of course, humidity. So basically, the climate effect of plastics is depicted here. Then we used collector model systems on which we superimposed uh, these climatic conditions and then calculated from these model systems what kind of temperatures, what kind of pressures, what kind of stresses in certain geometries may be seen by the polymer. Uh, and then we went into conventional data bank systems and we were looking for those plastics that exist. Or we defined uh, the research goals for material improvement. Uh, I don't think there's any other effort worldwide that I know of that has taken such a comprehensive approach. Uh, at this stage, we translated it uh, uh, to components all the way for a couple of regimes, particularly now for uh, uh, Europe at this stage. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the next generation uh, of collectors, uh, which are built up much, much uh, 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 flatter uh, than conventional collectors. Uh, and the key idea is to keep the pressure levels uh, and all the functional elements such that you can use it like a Gardena system because the high cost in uh, collector systems currently, as in many other cases, is installation. Uh, and if plastics from Lego on, they, uh, if they can do something, it's can, they can ease up installation. So these are just two uh, currently uh, current models uh, that those companies are trying uh, to get into production. Now our friends from the um, uh, industrial design uh, department uh, with their students groups, they came up with all kinds of designs. Uh, some uh, may be working, others may be just looking good, and we, others again may not even be looking good. But uh, uh, they have pump systems uh, of a la uh, large area type, they have modular systems, uh, they have outback systems, so this is something that uh, may be of interest for this country, you just take it into your car and uh, uh, take it on a trip. Um, we again calculated what it means to fulfill something what is referred to in solar thermal as the Greenpeace global 100% scenario. Ah, this is even tough for the plastics industry. Up to 2050 average double digit growth. Uh, I don't think um, uh, that we actually will be needing that. And to be quite honest, I think there's other technologies now coming in, taking uh, a big chunk of that cake. But what remains is, uh, for those reason, uh, areas and applications where it does make sense, we still need extraordinary high growth rates. And it's the combination of property profile, design, and uh, the high growth rate capability that actually uh, speaks for plastic. I calculated here again how many million tons that would be, and that again explains why the plastics industry is interested. Uh, I sort of jumped nearly over the, um, um, the photovoltaics work that we are also doing. In photovoltaics, our hypothesis is all cost reduction, which was significant over the last years, was driven mostly uh, by sale cost reductions there's hardly any contribution on the plastic side. So producing modules nowadays, the share of the encapsulation materials, embedding, back sheets, they are using processes for somebody who has been working in other plastics areas, it's more like what I was exposed to in aerospace, you know, where they were building one huge component in a month. Okay, they're producing more a day, but uh, they have uh, cure cycles of say 15 minutes for one module. Uh, this is a speed which is for plastics something which is like uh, last century. So here we are working on new concepts of um, um, uh, encapsulation materials. 
in order to keep the cost further down, so uh, uh, to speed up grid parity. And essentially, how it can be done is sort of quite obvious uh, from a polymer point of view. Uh, to change the chemically uh, peroxide-based uh, encapsulation materials, to exchange those via thermoplastic uh, elastomers, which just need to be heated up and cooled down. Uh, those can be uh, worked continuously, so there is a uh, wide range of uh, additional cost reductions uh, uh, to be anticipated from these technologies. Let me come to uh, a couple of final remarks. Uh, first of all, I think it will be extremely challenging to keep up these growth rates uh, once one looks into that and uh, looks at the capability of various um, industrial routes, production routes. This is an, an extraordinary ambitious route. It needs big players uh, uh, in order to drive such a development. It needs a lot of research, which is, of course, great for all of us uh, working at uh, universities. Uh, and it needs a lot of joint research between academia uh, and industry. Uh, a second important aspect that relates it now to democracy. If one analyzes what has happened in uh, Germany, first of all, the fifth year in succession, um, in Europe at least, was renewable energies outperformed in terms of added capacity or others. Uh, in fact, if one accounts for what has been built up new and taken out, nearly 100% of what's added, newly added, is renewable capacity. Uh, the more important thing is even, who owns this? It's the citizens, it's the communities who own that, it's not the large energy companies any longer that own that. Their participation, 3% in PV, 10% in wind power, and of course, a system that is owned and is structured by small size uh, and interaction of small, small size supply, large size, uh, size supply, uh, also implies a different grid system uh, in terms of smart grids. So this is the big fight right now where uh, large enterprises still tr uh, try to find their way. Now, interestingly, um, I uh, ran across uh, a long time ago already plastics from their very outset. Uh, the first cellulose plastics were celebrated as democratic materials when packaging came out uh, because for the first time uh, objects became available to the common public that uh, at that stage were only available, of course, to aristocrats. And the same is the idea, of course, here. Uh, uh, what I would like to, to, to highlight is uh, plastics can make, uh, of course, a significant contribution to cost reduction and to actually widen uh, uh, the excess. Where can they come from? The most beautiful example of uh, material utilization, reutilization that I ran across in solar uh, was given to me uh, uh, by a biologist, Professor Ijai from Israel. Um, he had published in a paper uh, that these um, uh, Vespa Orientalis, they put their eggs, of course, uh, in uh, such a cell structure. Uh, and the important thing about the cell structure is it needs to keep the temperature plus minus 1% in order for the eggs to survive. The outside temperature variation is plus minus 10%, uh, 10 degrees C. Uh, and I don't think there's a, a lot you can do wrong with such an experiment. I mean, you take a thermocouple and measure here and there. Uh, so he was figuring out the structure works. It's built again out of cellulose uh, waste paper. So, uh, uh, of course, the uh, Vespa juice it sort of up, it intermingles it with certain substances. To my knowledge, it's not resolved yet from a material, material science point of view, so maybe it may be interesting to look into that phenomenon. Uh, uh, here's a couple of, uh, say, ideas of how it should work. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I can't really say whether that may be true or not. Now, second last slide. Um, all of that, uh, of course, is related uh, to next generation people. I think we need those people, of course, um, in order to really uh, uh, support the boost that's coming. So uh, educating people in this field uh, uh, is uh, a privilege. 
And here are some dissertations and names and Gernot Wallner, who I'm still working with, so he's the co-director of all of our large programs uh, that we currently perform. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm grateful for having been able to work with all uh, those people up here. Uh, and last but not least, I think more important than the projects is, of course, the education issue uh, itself. It's the next generation who has to drive uh, uh, these high challenges that I was trying to highlight. And with that, I hope I was somewhat in time. Thank you very much for your attention.